Good morning, friends, uh, believers, Christians, brothers, sisters, all that are loved by God. I uh, just want to welcome you. And um, well, we, su we survived another week of lockdown. So you can pat yourself on the back if you are still sane after complying with the regulations of staying at home. It is sad also to see so many ignorant people still following their own ways, but then sad to know it is because they are a slave to this world. Then also we sadly notice more and more the poverty in our country. You know, we become more aware of their circumstances as we start to think more about them and their living conditions. People that live under poor conditions, women being abused in the house, people that stay in a shack and is used to daily income they get from begging. Now they are locked down and don't get that income. This goes hand in hand, if you guys remember with my message last week of being content. Friends, we have so much we can be grateful for. Well, this brings me to my message for this week. And the topic for this week is envy. Let's read our reading this morning from Matthew uh, 20, the book of Matthew, chapter 20, from verse 1 to 16. Then we will look at some more verses from Scripture as we study more about this topic. Matthew 20, verse 1 to 16, and it reads... For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and said to them, Why have you been standing idle, year idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. Verse 8. So when evening had come, the owners of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when, they, and when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden under the heat of the day. <clears throat> but he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first, and the first last, for many are called, but few chosen. Friends, what is jealousy? Well, the definition of jealousy, according to, uh, uh, according to the world, says it's a feeling of unhappiness and anger because someone has something or someone that you want. Now don't get confused with the word desire, which are rare in the Gospels. It's more common used in the epistles, but it has more sense of desire of hunger. We read there in Luke 15 verse 16, He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. See, as well here yeah, as in, in Luke 16 verse 21, the same word in the Greek are being used. It is also used for longing in Luke 22 verse 15. Let's have a look. It says, And he said to them, I have eagerly desired 
You see, here's that word, the same Greek word, to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. Now, this is not the word we will look at today, as it is used mostly for non-deliberate words, meaning it is not necessarily used for something bad, but mostly used for ordinary things, like longing or to see someone or to eat something. As an example, we as a family usually eat at 12 noon. And by 11.50, I'm certainly longing for the food. I have a desire for that food. That is this word, desire. You see, it's not necessarily a bad thing, although my belly might disagree. But it is just because I'm hungry, which is normal. So what is the meaning then of envy and how is it different than jealousy? There is not more difference between the two and that is what I want us to look at today. According to Cambridge Dictionary, it is to wish that you had something that another person has. We also read from the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary that it is painful or is resentful awareness of another's advantage joined with the, yes, the word, desire to possess the same advantage. Mostly it's used in a negative way. You know, in Old Testament, in Genesis 26, 14, it's used concerning material goods. In chapter 30, verse 1, a social status. It is, it is warning us in the Old Testament against envying the arrogant in Psalm 73, verse 3, the violent in Proverbs 3, verse 31, or the wicked in Psalm, Psalms 37, verse 1, or Proverbs 24, verse 1 and 19. That is the common use in the Old Testament. Due to all the verses that we will study today, which is a few, I won't read all of them, so please feel free to go back and read them at a later stage. Let's look more as to what the word envy and jealousy is in the New Testament. Let's identify it together when we become this and how it is shown in our lives. Let's look at different ways the word or the Bible has it's been used. The first one that we're going to look at is in Mark 7 verse 22. Mark 7 verse 22. Which reads, Adultery, here's that word, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, and here's our word in the same context, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. I'm going to word this point. This comes out of the person and it defiles. This comes out of the person and it defiles. The second place where it's used in scriptures in Romans 1 verse 29 in the same context and it reads, They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of, listen, here's the word again, envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips. In this context, it is here, it's used as it is a rebellion against God. Now this you will find a lot from the so-called atheists, which I believe is mostly agnostic. It's the group of people who don't know what they believe and it's because of denial or they just don't care. They have never actually thought about it that way. I had this conversation this week with such a person. He's an American living on an island not far from us in the Philippines. I posted something about the government in the States that was seeking God through this time of the virus and praying publicly. Now, to me, it was impressive. I didn't, wanna, I didn't have any political agendas. I just wanted to say that we believe or I believe the same way that this is how the government should be. Now, this guy, he was the first to attack. Anything mentioned about the gospel or God, they are the first to attack. These are the kind of people the Lord refers to in Romans 1 from verse 18. God says he gave them over to their sinful desires. Have you noticed when someone have these qualities? You can't discuss anything about God to them. They might say they want to learn, 
but their hearts are so full of evil and envy that they are out to attack. They just want to argue. They want to prove you wrong. This also came evident with this friend of mine. Listen, he ended his conversation with me after I told him, I don't want to quarrel or argue about it. This is what he told me. He said, you have to fight fire with fire. This is how they think. They have no love or mercy according to verse 31. Okay, point number three. The third place we're going to look in scripture. That's in Galatians 5 verse 21. And it reads, And envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Here it can also be seen as the word jealousy. Now the other place in the New Testament where the word can also be used as jealousy in this context is in Romans 13 verse 13 and also in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 20. But it is still in the same context. Okay, so I'm going to call this, this is a fruit of the flesh. Galatians 5 verse 21, this is a fruit of the flesh, which is opposite to the fruit of the Spirit. Number four, the fourth place we're going to look in scripture where this word was used in the Greek language with the same context. It's used in Titus 3 verse 3. And it reads, At one time we too were foolish. Listen carefully. At one time we too were foolish. That's what Paul is writing. Disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and, here's our word, envy being hated and hating one another. I'm going to call this verse unregenerate life. See, notice how the Apostle Paul refers to how we were before. Now, this is our life pre-Christ. The fifth place where it's used in Scripture, same context, 1 Timothy 6 verse 4. They are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strive. See, there's our word, envy, strive, malicious talk, evil suspicions. I'm going to call this context, this is a sign of false teachers. Okay, it's been talked about, about false teachers in the context. Now we've looked at five different examples in scripture where this word envy in the Greek language is is, is mentioned. Now what is the one thing in all these verses that is in common? What does it all have in common? In all of these cases or examples, it refers to the unsaved. I'm sure you are saying to yourself, hey, but this is me. <laughs> I sometimes also do some of these things. Well, if we are honest with ourselves. Therefore, the next question is, is it possible for us as believers to have this kind of envy? Well, let's go again to Scripture. Look at how Paul warned the believers, the believers in Galatians 5 verse 26. He says, Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. He's saying, let us. He includes himself in this. And we know that Paul was a believer. Also in 1 Peter 2 verse 1, he says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, he has the same Greek word, envy, and slander of every kind. Friends, he's talking to believers. So, you can breathe. We can do these things. It doesn't mean we are unsaved, like those that are believing in Lordship salvation, that can't sin. How do we rid ourselves from it or not become envious? Well, by understanding what it is and then remember what the Lord teach against it now that we are believers. So let's go back to our examples where we found the word envy and see what the Bible teach against it. So let's go back to point number one. The Mark 7 verse 22 where it says this comes out of the person and it defiles. Now, if this comes out of the person, 
I think the biggest problem here is the heart. Why do I say that? Well, God says in Jeremiah 17 verse 9 that the heart is deceitful above all things. Friends, if you don't guide your heart, listen, envy will flow from it. But we can guide our hearts. Is it not amazing how the Lord made that statement, but then later, not once, not twice, but four times, he said this. In Ezekiel 11 verse 19, he says, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. Listen, I will remove them from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then just a bit further on in Ezekiel 36 verse 26, he says, He said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Friends, it's mentioned twice in the book of Ezekiel. It's pretty important. Then listen also how the heart is then mentioned in the new covenant. We read in Jeremiah 31 verse 33, it says, This is the new covenant. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. Listen, he says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now, the same thing later in the New Testament, this is why we know the Bible is true, right? Years later, God referred to that, what he said in Hebrews 10 verse 16. He says this, this is the covenant in Hebrews, right? This is the covenant. I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now, I know you might say to me, but he's speaking to Israel. Well, I hope you all understand that even though Israel is mentioned, we understand that this covenant is the new covenant made for us as believers in the church age. It is a topic on its own, so I don't want to go too deep into it. But we know it. It is against the covenant that God made with the Mosaic covenant, under which Israel broke that covenant. Therefore, God promised a new covenant, which is spiritual for those who knows or and trust in him will receive what salvation so even though the fulfillment was to individuals it was also to the nation israel well you can read it in romans 11 verse 16 to 27 it is basically in this chapter from verse 36 following for us this covenant covenant was also announced by jesus christ in luke 22 verse 20 we all know that verse which we use at the Lord's Supper, but really exercised during the church era. And you can read all that in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 25, Hebrews 8 verse 7 to 13, 9 verse 15, chapter 10 verse 14 to 17, chapter 12 verse 24, and chapter 13 verse 20. All right, there's some reading for you to do. So this is just a small explanation of the meaning of the new covenant in these verses. But the point is, God gave us a new heart with new desires and it's up to us to capture our hearts through our thoughts and bring it into submission to God. We know we have it, therefore we can use it. But sometimes I know the flesh is just too strong. Like Paul said, he knows what he needs to do, but he does the opposite. Okay, so let's go back now to point number two. The Romans 1 verse 29, which is rebellion against God. So these days should be over for all of us. We rebelled against God until the day we surrendered our lives to him. This is true salvation. Well, Donovan May one day said something very interesting and something very true. He said, the way you live is the way you understand salvation. If I look at your life, I will under know how you understand the word salvation. Friends, we should not, as true believers, rebel against God. Yes, we still sin, but that is because of our sinful nature. The rebellion in this verse was those that not, was not yet saved. Point number three, let's go back to that one. Galatians 5 verse 21, the fruit of the flesh fruit of the flesh. Well, God teaches us in Romans 8 verse 9, he says this, you, however, 
are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, which he lives in every true believer, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. You can't say you have it and you're not a believer. Just the same way you can say you have it or you don't have it, but you're a believer. The Holy Spirit lives within us. Friends, we have victory in Christ to overcome the desires of the flesh. Point number four, the Titus 3 verse 3 example, the unregenerated life. Well, before Christ, before we got saved, Paul stated this is how we were. So we should meditate then on the things we are now. What has God given us in short? Well, if you continue to read in Titus in chapter 3, verse 5, just two verses on, it says, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. God gave us eternal life for free. And if we just meditate about that, then we would not want to have any envy, envy in our being. How can we envy anything if, you, if we know what is waiting for us, friends? The Bible says we have to eagerly wait for the day the Lord come to fetch us. Have you ever gone through a difficult time but knew something great is waiting on the other side? Well, here's an example. For us, as a family or me, it is when we are in Agutaya. Now, you have to understand, we are extremely busy when we're there. We are needed all the time. And we did not have any true fellowship. And we didn't have believers yet. When I started to become envious of those that have fellowship or have easier lives, I would also just think of our two-week break coming up in Manila after around every five months being on the island. This looking forward of what is to come gives me renewed strength and removes the envy. This is the same year in Titus. We might experience some difficult times on earth that might want us to become envious or jealous. But as soon as we think, listen, of spending not time in Manila, but of spending something much greater, spending eternity with him in heaven, then all envy will disappear. Friends, we have an amazing God, but an all-powerful God that just spoke and the people's knees bent. Paul couldn't, oh, John couldn't even stand up. He just passed out when the Lord spoke. This, however, friends, depends on if you understand what eternity with him means and who he is that you will be spending eternity with. If you understand that and you meditate about that and if you bring it to mind, I can promise you all envy will disappear. Next point. In 1 Timothy 6 verse 4, the sign of the false teachers. Well, it says they are conceited or proud of themselves or vain and understand nothing and therefore they quarrel about words. Now, I hope uh, that there's no uh, false teachers amongst us. But how can we look at this for us? We ought not to be proud of ourselves. Why? Because of His grace we received. You know, Ephesians, 8, uh, Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. We should boast in Him. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 to 31 says, It is because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts only in the Lord. Now, he saved us, not by what we have done, but what he did for us. We also know the truth, not like these false teachers. John 8, 31 to 32, he says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. His word is the truth, just as Christ is truth. We have his word and therefore we need to study it in order to be set free. 
So understanding we should boast in God for what He has done for us, and we, and we have and know the truth, we are not to be like the false teachers. We should not get involved in quarrels and vain ideas. So there, we looked at why we sometimes become envious, and also then what the Bible teaches of how not to be envious. Now to go just a little bit back to our reading for today in Matthew 20 verse 1 to 16 and bring it in line with what we have looked at today. Well, we notice the following. In the first verse, we know the person getting the laborers are the owner of the land. Bringing this to our study, well, this is the Lord. Well, unlike this owner, God is righteous and fair. I'll explain later why I mentioned this. But he is the owner of you and me. We have been bought with a price and as we discussed earlier, he gave us a new heart. He saved us by his grace. We also noticed that he offered work to people that had no work. They were standing in the marketplace waiting for work, right? He offered work to all that were standing there. Because how do we know that? We know he went back a few times to offer it again to everyone that was there. Friends, God offered his salvation to all people. And he does that over and over in each individual's life through circumstances and events. Note here, God didn't pick certain people that were standing there. He offered it to all. Next, he also made a verbal contract with each of them how much he's going to pay them. He said to them, it will be fair for you. And they agreed, so it was a contract. Everything belongs to the Lord and he will give it out as he sees fit as he is righteous. The things on this earth do not belong to any of us. We're not taking it with us the day we die. Then later we read when he paid them all the same, no matter how long they worked, some started complaining. Is this not exactly how we are? We are happy with what we have until we see what another has. Maybe in the same position at work as us. Maybe in the same complex that has a bigger house than us. Kids at school, maybe a friend with a nicer PlayStation or a nicer phone. Then we start to complain and become envious. Well, why do we do this? Well, I think most times it is because we see ourselves as more important or just as important as that person. We forget that everything that we have, everything that is on this earth, belongs to the Lord and not to those individuals. And the Lord will then decide what you need and what you will have and what we need to trust Him in. So when we complain, what are we actually saying? We're telling the Lord, God, we don't believe that you are a righteous God. Another thing we read in Matthew 20 verse 15, He says, Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? Well, God has the right to do whatever he wants. It's all his stuff. He's our creator. He created all these things. Let's not be envious on his generosity. He's generous with all of us in our own ways. He always has something that others don't. And that is because he's generous to us. Just the mere fact that you wake up in the morning and breathe. Is because of grace. He's generous to us. For the things that we do to him, we deserve way worse. So let's not look at what others have and we don't, but rather what we have, but yet we don't deserve. Let's be content with what we have. Remember last week's message? Concentrate on sharing the gift of salvation and see ourselves always as lesser as in Philippians 2 verse 3, he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Well, that's very difficult, but it's possible. There is the secret, friends. Let's concentrate on this for this next week. Let's uh, make this our work for this week. Well, I want to close with a story of a girl that was envious but the person she was jealous about practiced the teaching in Philippians 2 verse 3, and that changed the envy to repentance. Well, the story is as follows. It goes like this. I didn't get selected as the captain of the shuttle badminton team. My best friend, Navia, was chosen as the captain of the team. 
I was too angry in my sports teacher as I felt I deserved to be captain. Besides, this year we also had too many interesting school competitions and I prepared enough to be the captain. Navia was jumping with joy and my, friend, my friends were congratulating her. I was lost in my own internal battles that were running in my mind. How can you be jealous for your own best friend? You're a cheap-headed girl, Aja. No, I'm not jealous of her. It's just that I'm sad because I feel I deserve the post. And so on. I was actually wondering what was the reason behind my sorrow. Me not getting selected as the captain or my best friend getting selected as the captain. <laughs> Navja came to me and told how happy she was to be selected as the captain of the team. I gave a subtle smile and told, Congrats, buddy. Huh, we girls, we can never admit we are jealous. Days moved on and we started practicing for the inter-school competitions. Nafja was training pretty well. Although I always used to think that I can train the team better than her, I was too intolerant towards her. The moment she said anything like, Aja, that's not how you do it. You need to attack the backcourt. And so on. I would tell her, Nafja, I know how to play it. Just because you're the captain doesn't mean you're the best at it. I can do it. We are a team. Don't guide me so much. I could notice that my other teammates weren't liking this kind of behavior from me. Soon the date of inter-school competition was announced. The sport teacher asked us to start our final practice and told that we've got to make it to the national levels at this time. My school was always knocked out at the state level badminton tournament. Nafja has taken this way too seriously and she motiv motivated all of us to give our best. But then... She knew deep inside that I wouldn't consent to everything she says. She didn't treat me badly either. All she, all she would do was to gently tell me, Hey, I know you're a great player, but please follow whatever I tell. It is in the interest of the entire team. I would nod my head unwillingly. <laughs> Every time we played doubles, I never coordinated with her well. I was adamant. The most weighted date had finally arrived. We all, were, we all were all set to play and win the championship level by, by level till we reached the national levels. In the first match, as usual, Navja guided us with some tricks. I was too intolerant towards her even then. I don't know why she felt that I was the right person to go first. I went. I started playing, playing by applying my own methods. I didn't follow any guidelines that was given to me by the captain. I was too stubborn on proving that she was the wrong captain. Well, my tricks didn't work in my favor. I lost the first match. Navja had soon realized something. She just ran to my sports, te sports teacher. I thought she'll definitely complain about me telling I didn't follow her guidelines. Well, after five minutes, my sports teacher called me. I went to him fearing that I'm fired from the team. But what happened next shocked me. He told me, Aja, your captain, Navja, wants you to be the captain from now on. She says she's not capable of handling your team. So you are the captain from now on. Go take charge of your team and boost your team's spirit. I didn't know how to react. I felt so stupid about myself. I was too jealous of her and was oh unwelcoming towards her, all her efforts. And there she was, who was ready to give up her captain post because she wanted the team to win. It was a realization moment for me. I went to Navja and before I could speak anything she told me, hey congrats pal, you now the new captain. Forget whatever happened Aja, it's fine. You don't even have to be sorry. I'm your best friend and I'm proud that you are the captain of our team. Go on, it's time to show our team spirit. I didn't have to speak much. I just told her, Navja, I'm sorry. I was jealous of you. I learned my lesson. Please guide our team and thank you. Friends, Philippians 2 verse 3. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the new life you have given us in Christ. Thank you for salvation. Thank you that we can one day spend eternity with you. Help us to continuously look on to that day and look anxiously and can't wait for you to come fetch us. 
but also through the Spirit living in us that you have given us. We ask, Father, that you would always point out to us and help us and guide us when we have envy in our hearts. That we can think back on these verses that you use in Scripture in order for us to help us to not be envious. Guide our hearts and our lives in the days and weeks to come. And after con this uh, lockdown, Lord, if we get out and we meet up with other people, help us again to have uh, eyes to see a broken world, people that are not saved, that really need your gospel. Help us to more concentrate on that than to concentrate on other people's things that we don't have. But yet again, also see that the grace that you are showing us and the things that you give us that we don't deserve and how fortunate we are. Lord, we thank you again for this message this morning. And we pray this in your son's name, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.